Currently, I am a software architect at Microsoft, and what does that mean? Uh, it means that I was an individual contributor for a long time. I ran a development team in the optimizer, and now I work on the query processor and general querying problems at large. And uh, I work on future features that you'll see in the next two or three releases of the product, typically. So uh, typically, I like to say that my, whenever you have a problem that makes your query slow, it's, it's my fault. And that's probably the right way to have the mental picture, right? It's, there's actually more than just me who work on the team, but whenever you have a problem and it doesn't work right, it's because something in our model didn't quite cover what you're doing. And sometimes I can convince you that perhaps what you're doing is not the general case or for a general purpose query processor, not the, the average case. In other cases, it's actually an area where I can take what you're learning, what you've done, in your learning and take that to apply to our future product versions. So I actually really like to hear about stories and if you have a particularly crazy one and you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll give you my card, you can send me an email. All right, so pretty much everything in this talk will be stuff that CSS wouldn't support if I had to tell you about it. It doesn't mean that we're not interested to tell you about it. We actually want you to know about it. But please understand that what I'm actually about to go through is really, it's not confidential or anything like that. It's just details that can change from release to release. So it's not documented in Microsoft speak. So if you were to go and try to take some CSS guy and ring him around the neck and say, but Connor said such and such, they're going to laugh at you. And it's not my fault. OK, so I've already covered the questions. If you have a big question that you think the audience needs, or you're completely lost, I didn't make any sense, I used some weird text and slang, please raise your hands and call me out. If it's a more specific question, please hold it to the end, and I'll answer them. OK, so when I first talk to people about what it means to build a query optimizer, this is the starting picture. Uh, they pass in SQL, something happens, and they get a beautiful query plan that they're really happy with. How often is that really the case? Well, you'd be surprised, actually, you know, 98% of the time that's actually what happens. And in, in pretty much any case where I don't know anything about your application, if I were to build a model that made your application run and I got it 98% right without knowing pretty much anything about what you do, you'd probably say that's a pretty good deal. However, if your boss is yelling at you that, oh no, this 1% this query plan or 2% query plan is, is completely ruining our business, then it, it doesn't actually make you very happy. So understanding a little bit more than that is what the purpose of this talk is. So a few details you need to know. Commercial query optimizers don't actually try to find the best query plan. They try to find a pretty good query plan pretty quickly. And that sounds like it's a cop out, but it actually is algorithmically necessary. It is technically impossible to search all the possible query plans for every possible query you can write in SQL Server. Once you have about 40 or 50 joins, the number of possible alternatives is close, in, close to the number of atoms in the universe. So we just can't do that. So we have to have heuristics to search a subset of that space. And then to give you a subset quickly that is high value is actually another set of heuristics on top of that. So please understand that we're going to try to get your answer back to you quickly, but you might be able, if you spent all day working, getting a slightly better query plan if you force it manually. That's okay. And if you like that, please force it. But if you are trying to figure out what your expectation is about the engine, it should be pretty good query plan pretty quickly. Uh, so it took me 10 years to get to the point where I understand this topic well enough to come and talk to you. Obviously, 50 minutes will not cover it. So we will not try to make you all query optimizer experts, although we are hiring. So if any of you are, please let me know. Um, instead, I'll try to get you to the point where you can at least ask the right questions and sometimes answer them yourself. So let's go one level deeper past the magic happens part. This is a general picture I draw on the board whenever I go into any office of someone who doesn't know how to build query optimizers. And I show them this because it helps give them an understanding of the basic steps. So whenever you take a SQL statement, what happens inside the engine at a very basic level is we parse it into a tree. The tree looks awfully like what you think of the final query plan, but it's, it's more of a logical tree. That tree is a valid syntactic structure, but it's not it, you may not have the table T. If you just select start from T, T may not be there. After we have that tree, we go and bind that tree, which means we take and resolve things against the metadata, such as the table T and all the columns. We do star expansion, stuff like that. And after we get done with that, then we have something that the optimizer starts on. And that's when my job starts, which is how do I take that tree, that set of, that question of the system, and give you back an answer as quickly as possible. So the query plan is the search space that we do in optimization. and 
we go through many, many different possible query plan, query plan fragments and then come up with the one where we go, here you go, and that's the magic part. And so when we get it right, uh, people don't build statues for us. When we get it wrong, people tell us immediately, typically. So uh, let's see, is there anything else I missed on this? Oh, we've talked about heuristics. Yeah, we have some magic heuristics to try to make sure that we search the space quickly. And uh, how many people here uh, know how a chess program works? Like a program that would play chess against you. So you guys are a bunch of chess players. Come on, this is England. Uh, so the basic idea is you have this search that goes off and you continue trying all the different possible moves to figure out which one might be most valuable. So whenever the chess programs go and figure out what the next move is, they pick the next most valuable move that they think. And it's this continual search. And they can spend forever trying different moves and seeing which ones are valuable. Query optimizers are effectively the same kind of problem. We're not playing chess, we're looking at different possible query plans. So what's a query tree? So whenever you have a query tree, the first tree that we have, that parse tree, actually looks more like this than the final plan that you see. And I draw them all bottom up. Uh, this is a little different than how you see it in Management Studio. This is how we think about it. So when we talk about trees, trees grow up. In this case, they're upside down trees, but bear with me. So we have a logical join, we have a logical where, and a logical group by. There are also physical trees, which is what you see in the management studio. <laughs> okay, now we get to do another level deeper. So uh, if you were to go look at a different products optimizer, it might be set up differently. So this is how SQL Server's optimizer is set up. We have that bind part, which is here at the beginning. And then we have a couple of steps that happen. So we like to split things up into different phases because otherwise our heads would explode. So there are two main phases, and those are those bold lines in the, in the timeline there. One is called simplification. You can think of those as heuristic rewrites where we always do them independent of cost. And then we have this phase called exploration. And exploration is sort of the cost-based part of our query optimizer where we'll try to do a whole bunch of query plans, put a cost function on them, and see which one ends up looking the cheapest. So simplification has a series of steps inside of it, but effectively we try different transformations, like we move the where clause down towards the leaves, we'll find contradictions, I'll show you an example of that in a minute, where you don't actually have to execute that whole query tree subfragment at all, and we will also try to do other basic heuristic rewrites that we know are always good. Any ideas what kinds of things would fit into that category? Questions about what would fit there? The biggest, the biggest one is moving filters down towards the leaves. Why would you do that? Because we like them towards the leaves. Index matching, right? So if you want to do index matching, you need to move everything around to the point where you can say, ah, this is down towards the table which the index is on. So therefore, moving that around lets you do index matching. Uh, cardinality and costing I'll talk about in a minute, but we basically use, how many people know that we use a cost-based model? When you look at the query plans, they have costs. Yes, okay, good. I'm just trying to get a sense of the audience. You guys are a little stoic this morning. I'm gonna start asking questions. There'll be a quiz at the end, so, okay. So there's one plan all the way up to the point where we start exploration, one query, sorry, one tree, and then when we start exploration, there's a million of them, and then we collapse it down at the end to one tree again. That's the key piece I want you to take out of this slide. You don't have to understand all the different pieces that go on. Uh, how many people know about the auto-create statistics feature in SQL Server? How many people know what statistics are? Okay, good, good. You guys, are, you guys are doing well. So we'll go through after we simplify the tree and do this step where we figure out which predicates were used in the query that were interesting. And what, what does it mean to be interesting? Well, interesting means that you actually referenced a predicate in something that actually has a cost-based choice on it that we would use in exploration. And it passed through the simplification phase, which means we didn't simplify it out and decide that this whole tree was useless, subtree. So I'll show you an example in a second of contradiction detection after this slide. So once you have this tree, now you have to understand how to build knowledge on top of that tree. So we have this framework called a property framework to do that. So we derive information on each node and then we flow that up towards the top. And we can learn things by collectively seeing, oh, I know that this subtree has only one table in it, or I know that the predicates in this tree are in this range. So once you start building questions on the data, then you can start building transformations on that data to figure out how do I get a fancier query plan for you. So uh, these properties are done on each of the trees, the logical tree that we have and the physical tree. And they also exist in both the simplification phase and that exploration phase we talked about. 
So if you were to look at the logical tree, the kinds of properties we derive on that are, is this a key, like a primary key? So if you have a table, select star from T, we'll say, oh yeah, the key column's on column, call one, call two. And then later on, if you have a filter, we'll keep flowing that information through. And eventually, if you were to say group by on call one, call two, if we already know that it's a key, then we know that there will only ever be one row for each group, and we don't even have to perform the group by. If you have uh, read the book chapter I wrote, how many people here know about SQL Server 2008 internals? Yeah, okay, I wrote a book chapter about a year ago, and some of the examples from this are similar, but not the same. And so there's an actual example in that book about how properties can be used to get rid of group by. So understanding that teaching the optimizer a little bit about your application can help make your queries run faster is the bottom line. So in the physical space, this is probably where you guys are probably most familiar since you, you have this in the query plans. You can look at this. We have sorts, partitioning, various information about how the data is distributed. And that kind of information helps us in the physical tree do things like parallelism, the prior talk. And it also helps us understand, do we need to add sorts or not? So this is all the conceptual part. I realize there's not as many questions on this. We'll do more examples in a minute. So here's our first example. So this is called contradiction detection. This is a feature in the optimizer that tries to figure out if you've asked a question that doesn't need to be asked, right? You'd be surprised how often this happens. So if I do select star from T where column equals five and column equals six, how many rows should come back? Zero. And the reason is because you can't qualify both those predicates. They're contradicting. So in the logical space, we actually keep track of the valid domain range of each, every single query column that you have. And we figure out, are there any contradictions? And we'll even do it across joins and through other operators. We have a whole algebra of like 50 or 60 logical operators. And we basically have done this same logic over all of them. And we can learn whether or not you've actually asked a question that should never return rows. So in this particular example, it's, it's trivial. You can try it at home. I'll, I'll post these examples on my blog after the talk. Um, not well, after I get back to Texas, which may be next week. So uh, if I just do that same query, you'll notice that we don't have a join. The selects are from A join B on where co column two equals five and column two equals six. There's no rows that will ever be returned from this. This is a slightly more advanced version of the prior example. And you'll see that we just have this thing called a constant scan. What's a constant scan? Constant scan is just a dummy operator we made up. And it's, uh, we don't really want to go talk to a real table. We don't want to have to deal with the transaction log. Why don't we just return back fake rows to you? That's what we built. It's called constant scan, and it can return zero rows or one row. You can actually have, whenever you do uh, constant tables, it'll be encoded in this thing as well. So it's just our in-memory version of a set of table rows. And we can use this to drive various operations in the system. But in this case, what we're doing is saying, we have a tree that would have returned columns one, two, and three. Well, instead, why don't we just replace that whole thing with a constant scan and get rid of that tree? So knowing that you can get that to happen lets you know whether your application could have been simplified. So when you go look at a query plan and you see this constant scan, sometimes it's because your tree doesn't need to be as complicated as it is. So the neat benefit that you can get is, in the prior version of the example, before contradiction detection, you would have gone and taken locks and loaded up those rows and loaded them into the buffer pool and done all that work. And in this case, it actually just doesn't ever touch any of those things. There's no locks, there's no buffer pool touches, et cetera. You understand why this might be useful? Yeah, okay, good, nods, yeah, I like nods. Okay, so how do we get from where we were to the final version? We have these things called rules. How many people went to school? How many people studied math in school, right? And they teach about set theory, right? All the query optimizer is, this is a little secret, is a big set theory processor. It's pretty much the, the rule. So anytime you learn about A plus B is equivalent to B plus A, we have a rule. A join B is equivalent to B join A. And the reason is it's all the same stuff. So what we did was we coded each of those up in a nice little rule, and then we just run the rules. And we have hundreds and hundreds of rules because we've figured out all these interesting transformations, but that's really all it is. Now, that's not a trivial thing to build. That's why there's only a couple of competitors in the space and it's very valuable, so that's why you guys use it, but conceptually, it should be pretty straightforward for anyone who, who remembers grade school math. So we'll take and have a rule for joint computation. So we'll do B join A and A join B as equivalent. And so if you have a tree where you did select star from T join S, then we'll actually consider the alternative had you written it S join T. 
we actually will normalize all the queries, so it doesn't matter if you write it S join T versus T join S, because we don't want you to have to care for most basic logical equivalences. If you get really creative, or you know where the limitations are, you can get around that, but typically we try to make it so that however you write the query should generally not matter to whether or not the output plan is good or bad. There are uh, some other engines that in the past, other products that didn't have that property. So there's actually a misconception at times that you have to write the query in a certain way in order to get the plan that you want. How many Oracle people here? The current version of the Oracle uh, product doesn't have this property, but older versions did. So we have rules that will go in the logical space, like these math rules, and then we have these implementation rules, which will go from like join to hash join or join to merge join or join to loop join. And those are the two different major types of rules that we have. And these rules basically just run, and this is why whenever you go optimize a query and it takes a long time, we're just running these rules. We don't really know what you're doing. We just basically are looking at the math behind it. Okay, the memo. Where do we put all the different alternatives that we search? We have this thing called the memo, which is where we put them. It is really nice because it can detect duplicate trees. So if you built a general engine to say A join B is equal to B join A, then all of a sudden you have this problem of what if I generate the same tree more than once? Because you can end up with doing lots of work over and over again. The memo is the thing that actually helps make the optimizer go faster because we can figure out if we've already searched that space or not. You guys understand how when I talk about searching the space, it's the universe of all possible plans? I feel like Carl Sagan up here. Okay, so we have each part of that tree that we have will actually end up being a little section of this memo. And we like to figure out if there's anything that's equivalent to that little subtree. And then we'll find the least cost alternative for each of the subtrees and build up your final query plan. This way we can search each of those spaces independently and come up with the right plan for you. We use a top-down framework, which means we start at the very top and we match patterns. We have these wildcards in our rules. So when we do A join B is equal to B join A, we don't actually have to know what A and B are. They can just be any arbitrary subtree. So it's like a wildcard. So we just look at the join, and then we swap the inputs to the join, and we don't really care what's below it. So here's how it would work. If you had select star from A join B join C, it would look like this tree over here. And then this is the encoding in the memo. So we would take each of those little nodes and it would become a group. These groups have numbers. And we reference the group. So we have two join three is A join B, and you can see that there. And then we have uh, one join four, which is the result of two join three and group C. Good? It's important you understand this. Remember there's a quiz. So once you have this, then you can see here's how the rule transformation would work for the example I showed you. We take the join, split the inputs. We're actually not even looking at the groups. We don't even look at what A and B are. We just look at group number one, group number four, and then we put that back in, and we have another alternative that's equivalent to the top node in our memo, and now we can cost each of those separately. Okay, so how do we determine which one's good or bad? We have a model that evaluates a function on top of each of the trees, the physical trees that we implement, and it's based on two things, cardinality estimation and costing. Cardinality estimation is figuring out roughly how many rows should come back from each logical operator, and costing is, for each physical alternative of implementing each logical operator, how much should that cost in terms of CPU, I.O., et cetera. So when I talk about those terms, that's, that's what I mean. So cardinality estimation is based on a couple of different concepts. How many people here have done statistics manually at any point in their life? Right? When you create statistics manually, what's actually happening is we're going through and looking at the columns and creating histograms, things that are called frequencies and densities, and for, for string columns that are, for small string columns, non-blob string columns, we'll create these things called tri-trees. So a histogram is basically for every row that we looked at, we keep track of the number of counts of them, we keep that over the whole domain. So if I have a distribution, it'll tell me whether it's even or not. For a multi-column frequency or density, that is for each combination of columns, like call one, call two, how many unique combinations of values did I see for that set of columns? So if it's just one column, it's, e it's easy. What's the average number of unique values duplicated? So if I have the same, if I have one table with a thousand values in it and they're all one, then the frequency is a thousand. 
because I only have one value and it's a thousand times. If I had two values in each a thousand times, the frequency is still a thousand because it's the average frequency. But as soon as I start adding multiple columns, now it starts to get interesting. So if I have call one, call two, what I'm actually interested in is how many rows would come back if I did group by on call one, comma, call two. So that, that computation actually helps us figure that out for you. So that's how we do the math on it. I cover some of this in my book and it's, uh, it's really boring to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I tried my best to avoid it. it all, I have people who work on it so that I don't have to. Uh, so if you have questions about it, I'll be happy to answer them, but I'm not gonna dwell on cardinality estimation if I don't have to. We derive cardinality estimation bottom up, so we'll say how many rows are in the table T? Let's say it's 1,000. There's a filter on top of it. We say, oh, the filter is going to keep one-tenth of the rows based on the histogram, so we'll say, okay, 1,000 times one-tenth is whatever, and that's the cardinality estimation for the query. Once you get past that, the implementation physically would be how much memory do you have, how many IOs do you have to do, et cetera. The tip I will tell you is statistics profile on. How many people use statistics profile on? Yeah, okay, you should try this. This is really easy. Just turn this on, run your query, it'll give you your results for your query, and then it'll give you another row set, which includes every single operator in the, in the final plan, including how many rows were estimated for each operator and how many rows actually came back for each operator. So you can figure out if cardinality estimation is screwed up. About half of the problem queries I look at across the world are cardinality estimation errors. And they can be fixed by updating statistics or looking at your query plan shape a little bit to see if it's a supported operator or if you're using something really funky that the optimizer can't model. I'm not gonna be able to cover all the different things that we model and don't model today, but there are, the model is, has limitations and it can do a lot of the basic things, but if you're doing something very funky, well, you get funky results. So try that out, it's pretty neat, it's, it's easy to do. If you have questions, you can look at my blog or send me mail. So costing is the second part, which is when we get into the physical space, how do we get trees to come out? Uh, costing is useful because it takes account how much memory do you have in your system, how many CPUs do you have in your system. It doesn't take into account things like how fast is your CPU versus someone else's CPU. So a funny story, we had this guy named Nick, and Nick used to do the costing in SQL 7. And so all the cost units in SQL Server are calibrated to Nick's machine, number of seconds on Nick's machine. We kept that machine around for a long time. <laughs> Eventually we gave up on doing that. Now it's just sort of, uh, it kind of floats a little bit, but it's, it's all relative to the original numbers. And the reason we did this is it's actually just, it would be insane if you went from development to production and all of a sudden all your query plans changed, which may happen anyway, but if they just changed just because the machine is slightly faster, then you've wasted a lot of time. It's just not practical from a labor standpoint to build a system with that much flexibility in it. So we actually made the relative speed of the I.O. and the relative speed of the CPU to be mostly fixed for the sake of this discussion. In the future, we may make those things slightly tunable, but overall we think that was generally a good call. I see about maybe one case a year where someone has escalated up through CSS and said, oh, had you taken into account the CPU speed or the fact that I'm running on a SAN, I would have been able to do this so much faster. And that does happen. And understanding that this is not part of the costing model can mean you can see when the optimizer makes a mistake for your particular physical machine. And if it's important, you can go fix it. But please understand that there are limitations to make it easier to use. Now we do keep in, uh, we do keep track of how many threads or CPUs can be assigned for a query. So when you optimize a query, you have this max DOP thing. And if you watch the last talk, you'll see that that can actually change the query plan substantially, both how it executes and what the shape of it is. The degree of parallelism and how the data is partitioned, if you're using partitioning in SQL 2005 or 2008 enterprise, gives you this division effect on some portions of the query tree, and that can cause different plans to get picked. So whenever you're doing testing, you should understand if I have a development environment where I don't have the data partitioned or I don't have multiple CPUs, and then I go into production, those are areas where things can change. And so one of the reasons people just say, run DOP1 in production, at least for OLTP systems, is they don't wanna to have to deal with this. And you can just say, well, I don't wanna to have to understand that complexity in my, my model. So that's actually the response. And that's a perfectly valid answer if you don't wanna deal with it. But at the same time, if you need to know, this is why it works that way. So in order to make the costing model work, we actually also made several other assumptions in costing. One of the assumptions is that when you first run a query, that the data is not in the buffer pool. And what does that mean? Well. That means that we're gonna to have to go to disk for each of those. 
first IOs until they get in the buffer pool, and then it's just memory accesses. The biggest cost in pretty much any query plan is random IOs, and more generally, IO. So once you have the data in memory, you can do a lot, you can get past a lot of things that are slow. So understanding that the costs set up so that the first plans, that are, the plan that's picked will assume that the plan is not in cache to begin with, will give you, a, it can cause the query plan to change, especially for these little seek scan flips for small queries. And so some customers find this is one of those areas where I might get called and go, we don't like this. And I'm like, well, tough. You can force it. Uh, so we assume that, we also assume that your IOs are random and uniform, which means that if you're gonna go seek into an index, you do A join B and you're doing an index lookup into B, we're gonna assume that those are not physically co-located. So if you're seeking for some set of values, we're gonna assume that they're all over the, sp the space of possible values that are in the range. So if you said greater than 10, less than 20, we'll say, okay, within the range of 10 to 20, they are randomly distributed or evenly distributed. Why would we do that? because it's a guess, we don't know. But what that means is, that's how many random IOs you can have, right? So it might be that you've built your system and put all the data that you're querying on its on, all on exactly one page, and we end up with a different query plan as a result. So understanding that these are the limitations of the subsystem means that when you're doing your testing and validation, you can see, well, why would the query plan come out this way? Now you have a couple of reasons why. Okay, I promised to get done with the dynamic, the, the academic lecture and get on to examples, but I needed to give you one more section, which is on how we search the space. So we have uh, this dynamic optimizer, as I explained, we go through and search the space and then we'll give up after a while when we decide that you've done, we've done a, a good enough job to find a good plan quickly. So the good plan quickly part is actually set up in different stages. We group our rules based on how valuable we think they are and how expensive your query is determines how many stages you go through. So if you're just doing a regular OLTP application where you know, you're moving money in and out of a bank, all the queries are small, the costs of those are always gonna be low and you're probably never gonna consider the later stages. The later stages is where we do things like parallelism, uh, index view matching, things like that. Really fancy star join exotic patterns for data warehouses. So if it's a cheap query, we'll just give you the cheap set of rules. And if it's a more expensive query, we'll try harder until we think we found a good enough answer. So when you see the optimizer spending a long time, that means that you've probably gone into a later stage. And you can go look in show plan XML to see how far it went. And I described the sections in, in my book chapter, uh, but basically there's a, if you go back to the earlier picture that we had, no, I'm going the wrong way, you guys are getting the future. Okay, so here you see stage zero, one, and two. We actually will do the first, most plans come out of stage zero. And then later we'll do stage one and stage two if we need to for more expensive plans. So that's what I mean by this. Okay. Index matching. So now we're gonna get practical. How many people know what it means for a predicate to be sargable? Okay, sargable is this esoteric term, but it means search argable, which means you can take a predicate, select star from T, we're column less than five, that column less than five part, and turn it into an operation against a B tree, a seek effectively. So if you have a predicate that's sargable, then it can translate into an index seek, which means you can match indexes, which gives you an order of magnitude performance benefit usually. If you don't have a sargable predicate, then you might not be able to get that behavior. So understanding what's sargable and what's not sargable is actually pretty important. So if you do uh, convert column equals five versus five equals convert column, those two things actually have a big difference on the sargability of that predicate. The one where it's column equals convert five to whatever type you want is actually more sargable than the convert column, expressions on top of columns equal to constants. So if you can write your queries so that you actually say the column is sort of the left-hand side and whatever the expression is is on the right-hand side, that has a much greater chance of making that expression sargable. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, nods. So now, because it was too easy just to make up a crazy term like sargability and then give you all these crazy rules that are not documented in the books online, I'm working on that by the way, uh, we invented this other thing which said, you know what, even if it's not sargable, we can actually make the query go faster. So if you have a predicate that doesn't fit sargability rules, either because you don't have an index on that column or because it doesn't meet the sargability rules that I described earlier, then what you can do is actually take that expression, that where clause, and push it into the table scan or the index scan. And so it actually looks a little bit like it matched an index and made it sargable, but really it didn't. 
We call this pushed non-sargable predicates because this is how we talk, actually. <laughs> sort of a bizarre social arrangement. But really, that's, that's what it is. And the reason is we counted the instructions for how much it takes to go. Th what, what's really happening is whenever you scan, if you had where on top of a table scan, filter on top of a table scan, what's actually happening is the query is saying, get me a row. And the where clause is saying, well, I need a row in order to see if it matches the where clause. It says, get me a row to the table scan. Table scan goes and latches to the page, which means it gets the mutex for that page for a second, gets a row, moves it back up to the filter, releases the latch. The filter then says, oh, look, I've got a row. Looks at the row, runs an expression on it to say, hey, I don't qualify this. Sorry, let's go back and get another row. So it goes back to the page again, tries to get another page lock, gets the next row off that page, and keeps returning that, right? That takes a lot of instructions. And that means lots of CPU, which is bad, because that really oftentimes impacts how fast that query can run. So what we determined was, you know, for a lot of simple predicates, then we can actually just run that while we hold that latch. So if you've got um, 20 rows on that page and only one of them is going to qualify, we'll just keep running the expression internal while we hold that latch until we, that table scan finds the row that's going to return, and then it just returns it. And that actually is substantially faster. So on a lot of benchmarks, this has a substantial impact, 20, 30 percent. Uh, so now we have another problem, which is not all expressions are pushable, non-sargable predicates. So if you have lob expressions, lar large object expressions, they can be pushed. If you have CLR, they can't be pushed because they can allocate memory. You're not, not allowed to allocate memory inside of the page latch in the storage engine. So there's a pile of things like this that you can't do, but a lot of basic expressions can be. So this is oftentimes when I go look at applications that have not been tuned at all, this is the kind of thing that they haven't really worked through. What should their index strategy be? And can they push predicates or not? OK, more index matching. So let's talk about what a covering index is. How many people know what it means to cover? OK, this is good. We're getting closer. I will still explain it. Uh, so covering index, whenever, how many people used Microsoft Access? Dirty little secret, I worked on Microsoft Access for several years when I first went to Microsoft. And I actually worked on their query processor there before I moved on to SQL Server. Uh, they have this little field in there that says indexed, yes. right? That sounds really nice and easy. And it is. But what it really did was it created a single column index. And actually, a lot of the Microsoft people who use the ecosystem sort of think this way, because this is how Microsoft has taught them to think. They say, oh, yeah, I want to create an index on this column. That magically make my queries faster. No. I mean, yes, but no. The problem is it's actually harder than that. When you do select star from t where column equals 5, well, you may have an index on column, and that may help you qualify the rows, but that's actually not enough to satisfy the query. You might have to go back to the base table because you did star. You have to get all those other columns, and they're not in that B tree. In access, jet, the secondary indexes always did fetches back to the base table. So it didn't matter in access. But in SQL Server, you don't have to go back to the base table to get them. And actually, many of the performance advantages that you do get are when you don't have to go back to that base table, especially for OLTP or DSS kinds of applications. Data warehousing, you guys can glaze your eyes over because you don't have this many indexes. Uh, so whenever I want to do select call one, call two from T, well, I actually don't have to have a where clause at all, and I can still use an index to return the results, as long as I have an index on call one and then call one and call two in any order. Right? If I don't need order, I can still use that index and return the rows. Does that make sense? Yes? OK. So having your indexes be covering is actually substantial. And whenever we go and look at why an index isn't index, why an application isn't indexed properly, it's often because they haven't considered this either. So if I go and build uh, an index that actually has all the columns that are returned by that query, it can go from you know, minutes to seconds. So, it, and the reason is because of that random I.O. If I'm doing a lookup into a secondary index and then I go fetch back to the base table, what does that fetch? It's random I.O. Right? Random I.O. means you have to move the disk head. So you're looking at 10 milliseconds, 8 milliseconds minimum for every single one of those. Right? That limits how many you can do in a second. So you can add more hardware. Right? How many people here have infinite money? Right? I didn't think so. So eventually what's happened is you have these huge storage arrays, and you just start throwing spindles at the problem. And the reason is you're trying to spread out all those random IOs. Well, if you get the random IOs out of your application, then all of a sudden you can save money on your storage subsystem. Not always, but sometimes. Okay. 
Uh, so the types of plant, oh yeah, sorry, I should talk about, how many people have used the missing index DMVs? Yeah. So the missing index DMVs were this thing we created one day because, well, it's a longer story than I have time, but basically we did it without asking permission. <laughs> and we just sort of checked it in and, actually the whole DMV framework happened because I was pissed off one month. Um, <laughs> in, honest, in all honesty, I was, uh, I owned a framework that people were using to return back these, these tables of internal memory data and they didn't really, uh, they kept trying to do things that they shouldn't do with it and it would cause the server to crash and it just so happened to crash in code that I owned at the time. And after you know, 20 or 30 of these where people were claiming it was my fault, and it wasn't my fault, it was their code crashing in our space because the framework, which I didn't write originally, had this problem. Then I told my boss that I was going to go away for a month, and I wrote this framework, and now all the DMVs go through this thing called streaming table valued functions. So when you look in the query plans and see streaming table valued functions, think Connor was angry. So <laughs> don't make Connor angry. I'll make more operators. So the DMVs for missing indexes will tell you what the optimizer would have picked in the index selection code if it could. And it has a heuristic for what it wants to pick. Right? Now that doesn't mean that you should always pick it because it's still a local decision. It tries to figure out what it would do for this one query. What would be the perfect index for this one query? Not what's the best index for your workload. Now if you understand your workload in your head and you look at the index and go, oh yeah, it's pretty good. Probably would help the whole workload. Try it. <coughs> that missing index DMV has this thing called an include column where you can add extra columns into the index that are not part of the sort key. This is to make things covering. I hope you guys can follow my long-winded explanations. The next thing I wanted to explain was how the optimizer ranks different kinds of plans. So because it doesn't want to do random IOs, the first thing it looks to do is a seek in the clustered index when it tries to figure out, can it satisfy this predicate? The next thing it tries to do is, can I seek a non-clustered index instead of the clustered index and return the results? Actually, two and two and is actually split into two and two A, but it'll have one where it just seeks the non-clustered index by itself, and another where it'll try to join two non-clustered indexes or n non-clustered indexes together to get all the columns that are needed. And the reason is because joins don't necessarily have to be random IOs. And then if that doesn't work, then do the type of plan you would see in JET, which is seek some sort of non-clustered index and then do a fetch back to the base table, which are random IOs, right? This is why you see the system move towards hash joins once you start having a lot of rows returned. Because these random IOs for a nested loops join will eventually dominate the cost and it'll be the most expensive part and then other types of alternatives like creating hash tables becomes cheaper, relatively. Okay, so let's look at an example or two to make it real. I'm gonna walk over here so I can point. So this is the sargable thing that we did earlier. So if I have select star from S where column equals five, I'm gonna return one row, it's okay. I do a seek in the non-clustered index. Here's my nested loop join. I do a lookup back into the base table, which happens to be a heap in this case, but if it was a clustered index, it would be a clustered index seek. And then it returns a row. And the reason why this works is the original predicate was sargable against this index in I1. And uh, the, rows, the number of rows returned back is estimated to be small because the frequency is low. And as a result, then we can say, well, it's okay to do this nested loop join. Now let's look down here at the next case, which was select star from S where some expression on call one equals five. So I'm actually converting it to a string. Why would I do this? Well, I would ask this to many customers actually. <laughs> Why would you do this? But it happens. And I don't mean to sound facetious, but when you know how the sausage is made, uh, it is something that you actually try really hard to get out and tell people don't, don't do, or at least understand what you're doing. So what happens here is it actually looks like it might be an index plan. This looks pretty good, right? But it's index scan. And when you actually look at the index scan, you'll go down here and see that it has a predicate down in that index scan operator. This is not the seek. This is the, non, the pushed non-sargable predicate thing right here. And that means for every single row, we are still inside the latch executing that expression, but it's nowhere near as fast as that example up there. Make sense? Questions? Yeah. Okay, parallel queries were covered in the last talk in some detail. I'm not going to try to, to do that level of detail here, but I wanted to tell you why the optimizer would consider a parallel plan. Remember Nick's machine? If it's more than five seconds on Nick's machine, then we tried to run 
parallel. And actually, the first stage, when we go through the optimizer, we will generate only a serial plan. We have a property requirement that says, don't give me any parallelism. In later stages, we'll actually say, give me the best serial plan, and then we'll go back and say, give me the best parallel plan. So stage one and two will actually try to generate different plans that are explicitly serial and explicitly parallel. And the explicitly parallel plan, if you have any divisible part of your uh, work, which can be spread across threads, it'll end up probably getting picked, because that's obviously a, a good option. So this uh, gives you a chance to figure out, well, if I have a query that's only executing in four seconds, at least as far as the cost units are concerned in the estimated plan, then that's why you would see it not ever generating a parallel plan, unless you explicitly start to hint it. If you do max DOP, then obviously that changes the, the, the rules. So does everyone know that not every query operator supports parallelism? Right, have you had a case where you thought that a query should be parallel that wasn't, yeah, no? Well, you guys are lucky. I see lots of these. Uh, and it's because people have done things that don't quite fit the model. And the reason is, uh, to be quite honest with you, not every single thing in the SQL Server language is, has been set up to support parallelism. It's not that it can't be. In some cases, it's hard or ex extremely expensive to do so. So if you have a query that you think should be parallel, it's not parallel. Try split up in a little smaller pieces and see when does it stop not being parallel. Because oftentimes you might have a UDF or something that you're using in the middle of the query that affects whether that parallelism property can be satisfied in the optimizer. And if you can figure that out, you can at least know, well, that's the question. Why do I need this UDF? Or I can talk to CSS and understand better why is that causing problems. Yes, sir? Oh, you're just stretching. Wow. So the question is, uh, sh what's the sweet spot for where we should start considering parallelism? Should it be greater than five? There's actually a knob that you can do in SP configure, which is the minimum cost threshold for parallelism. And we don't generally tell customers to change the setting. However, for each application, it may be that you don't like to have parallelism if it's just a little bit of parallelism, right? So it could be that you want to make a distinction between your basic regular operational queries and your reporting queries. And for your particular workload, you don't actually want to bother applying multiple threads until it's above a certain cost threshold. So that's why the knob is there. I, you know, to be honest with you, I rarely see customers change it. I much more frequently see customers just set the max DOP in SP Configure to, to govern how many CPUs can be assigned to any particular query. So uh, we did put it in there. It was used perhaps more in the SQL 7 days because people, we didn't know. But I just think people have left it there, and we've actually just sort of tuned it since then. But you're welcome to use it. Don't, don't interpret that as uh, lack of support. Just, I, I just don't see it frequently raised as an issue. But see, what I do is if I get large running queries taking over 30 seconds or so, yes. I'll increase it higher. It all depends on the, the reporting queries that it offers. Right. So if you, if you have a mixed workload where you're doing some, a lot of small queries, like you're a bank and you're writing queries that insert and remove money from accounts, and you have a show me the report for the boss query that comes in that takes a long time to run, that kind of mixed workload is where you would actually have this kind of desire to tune. How, much, how many resources do I allow that reporting query to have before I uh, try to just cut it down or, or not, uh, not assign as many resources to it? The SQL 2008 product has a feature called Resource Governor, which probably is where a lot of people are looking right now at how do I govern those different kinds of workloads to give you the same kind of effect. So we have this, the knob in, that we added in SQL 7 is admittedly crude because you don't have Nick's machine. But it is, it is doable, and you can play with that knob, or you can play with the DOP knob, or you can play with this resource governor feature if you have the right SKU of SQL 2008. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Please go on. Um, I was sent a query just about two weeks ago, and I've, I've seen similar behavior in the past. And it was written by someone else, let's just make that clear. It wasn't the best query I've ever seen. You know a guy, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I've heard that story, too. Yeah. Yes. It was running in parallel. Mm -hmm. I was looking at. It was basically, I was sending because it was never retaining any data. Okay? So I looked at the execution plan. It was running in parallel. And when I was executing the same query, multiple threads stopped to block each other. Yes. So I put max DOP to one and it just ran it, two, it ran it seven seconds. Uh -huh. So how does that work? <laughs> 
Uh, actually, they covered this a little bit in the prior, prior talk, but I'll give you the short version. Um, whenever we create a parallel plan, there's actually several assumptions. We try to do a little work to spread out the operations evenly across the threads, but that's not always possible. And it's not always possible even if we know the right data. So I'll, I'll give you an example. An unnamed Microsoft product that I have been helping has a table with 4.7 billion rows in it. And they have been attempting to add partitioning to it. And the first attempt that they did was rebuild the index into a partitioning function where they actually had all the rows going into one partition. This is SQL 2008. So the partitioning model is basically the same as the parallelism model. So what actually happened is they wanted to, we wanted to create a parallel plan because it was a very expensive query. If you're gonna process over four billion rows, I mean, it's gonna take a while, uh, eight hours, to be honest. Um, and the problem is that when we actually set up the function to dynamically spread the rows apart, well, they all were in one thread because they were all the same partition and we weren't able to do anything about it. So it ends up being a question of, can the data be actually split across threads correctly and can we estimate that properly? Sometimes it's a combination of how many threads do you have and how many partitions do you have and are the partitions skewed? And in non-partition tables, it can be just, do you have the right um, histogram on the data? So if you have data that's coming in from like a table valued function, instead we don't, we don't have statistics on it, then we're gonna guess and it may be that we guess wrong. So typically when you see those cases, going to max DOP1 gets around the problem because you're not actually having to try to distribute things across multiple threads. But again, if it's not helping you, that's a great case to do that in. So you have to figure out, well, that's an example where a SQL Server in the future hopefully can do a little better for you. Okay, now if you thought the earlier part was fun, let's talk about updates. Update queries are the biggest piece of complexity in our product. Like we actually have this thing that goes and measures the cyclomatic complexity of the code, basically how many different paths are there through. Number one, updates. Everything else in the product, not as hard as updates. And the reason is that updates are this thing where everyone looks at how fast it goes and they don't actually have any idea what we're doing. So what I'm gonna to explain to you today is how does an update plan work so you can look at that big old nasty thing that comes out and have some idea what's going on, All right? So there's a couple of different things that happen inside of an update plan. The basic parts are easy, and after that it becomes just various degenerations into how much do you care. So you can glaze over after the first section or two here. How much time do I have left? Now, oh, okay. We'll go quickly then. So if I, um, first thing you do is you read the rows off of whatever the table is you're scanning, and you compute the new value, and you write it back. So far, so good. That's the easy part. Now, the question is, how many rows are you modifying? If I modify just a couple, we'll actually go and say, every time you modify a row, you're not actually just modifying a row. You're modifying all the copies of that row. So you modify the base table, and every secondary index, and any index views, and if you have query notifications, those are also modifications where you actually send a message out. So that's another set of discussions you have to have. Do you have a lot of rows or not? Because we end up doing it per index or per row. So the per row one is for the low cardinality, and the per index one is where we can actually say, you know what, if we take all the IOs that are gonna go against this one index, put them all together, sort them, and apply them linearly, I can take those random IOs and turn them into sequential IOs, which we all know makes queries faster, right? That's good, because that keeps me in business. So uh, those are the two main versions of plans. Now we have this thing, how many people have seen split, sort, and collapse in update plans? Yeah? You wanna know what it does? Yeah, because it's, it's another one of those things. So let's say I do update uh, table set primary key equal primary key plus one. Let's just say it's an identity, or some sequential integer thing, since you can't set up you can't modify identity columns directly in default. So what ends up happening is we actually got smart one day and said, you know what, if you're doing an update, that's kind of like a delete and then an insert. And then if we take and sort on all the keys and that operation, we can actually figure out that sometimes you're really doing this plus one kind of thing. And what you really wanna do is just delete one single value at the beginning of the index and insert one value at the end of the index. 
Well, we implemented that, and that's what split sort collapse does. It goes and figures out for each and every index, how do I sort the IOs and get rid of all the extra ones I don't need? So it can take split updates into insert and delete, sort, which is just sort, then collapse will figure out if you have delete and then insert for the same value, why do it? And that's what it does. So when you start trying to take that and apply it to a query plan, I think I have a picture. Maybe I took it out. No, I took it out because it, it was too perilous. It was horrible. Um, do your own update plan, and you can see this. If you have questions, I'll post them on my blog about it. So I have to mention the book. This is the chapter. You can welcome to go look at that if you have questions. I kind of cover some of these same topics with more examples. I have a blog. It's right here. You can just look up Connor versus SQL, as long as you can spell my name. Over here, it's not as big a problem as in the States. They're really horrible. It's C-O-N-N-E-R, K-O, whatever. It's amazing how much they can screw it up. And with that, I'll ask that uh, you tell me any questions you have. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> questions? Yes, sir. Triggers. triggers. How do triggers get work? How, triggers are an extension of updates. Um, conceptually, an extension of updates. So when we do the update plan, we note that we have to update a trigger. We insert values into another magical index, and the magical index is uh, the inserted table or the deleted table, if you see that. And then later on, we run the operation after the update is finished. So there's like a second magic statement that happens to do the trigger. So that's conceptually how it fits in the model. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, speak up, please. Why don't we have multi-column auto create statistics? Um, that's a very good question. So when we do the logic in simplification to determine which columns are needed in the predicate, we could theoretically go and automatically create multi-column statistics. We have not done so yet. Because whenever we've played with it, we haven't found a heuristic that works all the time that makes sense for customers. That doesn't mean that there aren't such cases, but being able to reliably build one that doesn't slow down your query substantially is the, the challenge. So if you pull out the missing index details, can you use that to help the column? So if you pull out the missing index details, could that tell you which columns to use? Um, perhaps. It's not that sorting is actually, sorting doesn't need histograms. So it's not that having the index by itself means that you would know that. It, it might tell you the cardinality better, but you wouldn't create an index just to get a better cardinality estimate. I mean, maybe you would, but that's not a general statement for all applications in SQL Server. So if we're able to better factor the workload to understand, oh, well, you're an OLTP query application, you're an occasional DBA, please just do more for us. There might be a knob that we eventually put in a future version of the product that does something like that, and then we could be more aggressive in those ways. If we were to do what you're describing on a data warehouse, then it might take hours even just to create a sampled statistic, and that becomes very challenging. So we have to figure out how do we balance those different kinds of workloads correctly. Now, it's not an excuse for us not solving the problem, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how it, why it's hard. More questions? No? Yes, sir. Uh, with the missing index DMV, what I've done is uh, you, you, can actually, you can track the indexes that are not being used. Now, I've removed some of the indexes mm -hmm. that are not being, being used, and they were being used. Yes. Can you explain what that's happening? So the question is, so there's, there's actually, the question is, why would my missing indexes look like they're not being used and then, I have, then they would show back up as being needed? Yeah. Um, it's actually more complicated than that. So I'm assuming you're using the index usage stats to determine that you're not seeing an index, which is yeah. different than missing indexes. So there's a second set of DMVs called index usage stats. So the reason why this might happen is workloads, basically. You either for a while are running a workload where you don't touch that index, and so it doesn't look like it's needed, uh, and later on it's, it is needed. So the missing index DMVs keep track of information while things are in the cache, the procedure cache. The index usage stats, I believe, are since the start of the server. So these have slightly different lifetimes, the data there, and actually that's this is a result of Connor being angry and making DMVs without having lots of rules behind them. 
Uh, so ultimately, the long-term picture is that we have to have a more consistent picture of how do you use this diagnostic data to make decisions on your application. So because those two things were created by two separate teams and they have two different data lifetimes, you might see that sometimes they're not perfect unless you control this situation completely, like restart the server to reset those values or run the special magic DBCC command if, the, if those DMVs have been hooked up to have a magic DBCC command to reset them. Right. Yeah, so it could also be that sometimes when you re-optimize a query later, it would have picked a different plan because your data distribution's changed. So the, an the, the short answer is it's complicated, but basically it, it can have these effects. So as soon as you start seeing things like this, you need to be careful, make sure that you have a nice set of indexes, try capturing a trace, running it through DTA, and those will give you workload level uh, suggestions about what kinds of indexes to have. Yeah. It's a little bit more expensive. You have to have it offline or do it at night or whatever, but, but that's why you would use the missing index one is really good for quick problems. The, the DTA type of product is better for, I know this is my best average workload. Please optimize for that. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, uh, have you thought about putting DTA inside the engine? It seems to work okay for me, is that right? Uh, yes, we've talked about it. There are, I guess I'll say I have large interest in self-tuning systems, but I wouldn't hold my breath. It's a very, very hard problem. So there's definitely a lot of things that we have to do in order to make our product better and making it so that you can get your job done as easily as possible without having to come listen to me talk about why all the things can break is one of the types of areas that we like to invest in. But we don't have anything to announce at this time. All right. Um, oh. Yes, sir. Um, functions, you used to find functions. Scaling used to find functions in a query. Uh -huh. That's a great idea. Data. Is there any way you can sort of optimize that any better? I know obviously they're not the to Right. So the question is, if I have a scalar user-defined function, do they just do scalar logic, or do they actually run queries that return scalars? Okay. I mean, not that I drive them, but I do come across Right, you know a guy. Right, right. I've heard a story. <laughs> um, so the question is, what's up with these? How do they work? Um, so there's several things that I'll tell you. First of all, user-defined functions, we don't have good histogram support for them. So whenever you run a filter with those, the optimizer's like, what, what are you thinking? Please, please, we're just going to guess. And then we guess, depending on what kind of predicate it is, we'll say 10% or 30%, which can lead to whatever results might happen. As long as you care, you're going to probably notice that eventually. If you, there's a bank in Turkey that I worked with once, and it decided that because it liked to program procedurally, they wanted to put every subquery inside of a, a UDF. So it would pass in an argument as the filter criteria and then return back a scalar argument as the rows. And needless to say, they had, um, they had problems, <laughs> many problems, which uh, things roll downhill and they become my problem. So this particular answer is you should rewrite your application to not do that and you should actually do joins and the reason is because we can use our model. Uh, long term, maybe the answer is that we need to make it better for the programming model for the, so that you don't have to worry about this kind of thing. For scalars, the reason why people use regular expressions, uh, not queries, is that it, it's like a macro, right? It gives you the ability to put code in there. And to the extent that it doesn't impact the query, so if it's just at the top of the select and you're not using it to qualify rows, doesn't matter to me, have at it. But you need to understand why that doesn't matter. And the reason is because you don't touch this model. As soon as you start touching the impact of that model, you're going to get different results, and then you're going to be angry at SQL Server. And now that you've all gone through my first class here, you can't be angry at SQL Server right away. You have to figure out what happened. And then you can be angry at me or whoever else, because either you screwed up or we haven't done something yet for you. And I want you to be able to make that distinction. So my general advice is don't run queries inside of functions if you can possibly avoid it. And then join, you put that, query, put that function inside of another query. Every time I see that, it makes my head explode because I, I have to find a nice way to explain that you've done months of development work and you're screwed. <laughs> that just doesn't go over quite as well. I'm not, I'm not the most delicate on that discussion. So uh, there was a question in the back. Do you know? 
All right. Well, I'll, I'll stay afterwards if you guys have more questions. You just want to talk to me individually. Thank you very much for coming. It's great to see you all.